Amen. So, um, at the midpoint of James chapter 3, James asked a question in chapter 3, verse 13. He said, he asked this question, who is wise among you? And then James goes on to contrast worldly wisdom with heavenly wisdom. And James write on, writes on how jealousy and selfish ambition and the unbridled tongue in the church, actually, when we give way to the temptations to yield to jealousy, selfish ambition, and let our tongues go, how these things are actually unspiritual and actually have their sources in the evil one. And these things tend to lead churches to disorder and division. And James goes on to define what heavenly wisdom is and how we can partake in the blessings of God by being a peacemaker. But this is such an important topic for churches, I I believe, that James opens up the next chapter of his letter by defining what the disorder and division that he was speaking about consisted of. So we're going to dive deeper into the subject in my message this morning, which addresses conflict in the church and what to do about it. So please turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 4 and our text this morning is from verses 1 to 12, starting with verses 1 and 2. James writes, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. So James properly identifies from carrying over from chapter 3. James properly identifies the attitude of jealousy and selfish ambition growing between believers as the source of fights and quarrels. So he tells us that the disorder and division that comes from this have their source in battles of conflicting inward desires. And because we're living in a sinful world, Each one of us, without exception, faces these kind of battles on a regular basis. The spiritual man is always battling against the fleshly man. And the inner conflict is actually, if you put it into simpler words, this inner conflict is actually a battle between human pride and godly humility. And it's a daily thing. Fights and quarrels referred to in this passage if you look at the Greek word that they used to talk about this fighting and this quarreling, it, the Greek words, they, they, they have a militant flavor to them. And you might say in, in English that the fighting and the quarreling might be referred to as aggressive and combative verbal disputes over things. The temptation... To dispute. It's really latent within our sinful natures, isn't it? By nature, we desire to be right, to have control over cir- circumstances that we face, and to be viewed as respected authority. And when this attitude is embraced, s- sadly, it keeps it does, it does nothing to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Often the battles that happen among Christians are, are bitter and severe, and all of us have faced these. We've been dishers out, and we've been receivers. The heart of the problem of our longing to be right is latent within our fleshly pride. And when we realize that a brother or sister of ours has a differing viewpoint on an issue and disagrees with us, it feels as though our credibility is being questioned and our fleshly pride 
gets wounded. And that's where we have to make a decision. We have two choices, really, to make. Either we dig in for a fight to maintain our ego, or we back away gracefully and prayerfully with godly humility. And sadly, all too often, there is a resulting argument that takes place. And worldly wisdom is embraced rather than heavenly wisdom. Worldly wisdom tells us to win our way at any cost, sacrificing everything to get what we want, including the welfare of other people. And when we give this way, we give this desire its way. And we try to prove and fight our point. So much damage is done. May God have mercy on us all. As a point of review, James already told us in the first chapter of his letters in verses 19 of the first chapter of James, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So what does this mean? It means that we ought to think very carefully before we speak. Is angrily arguing our point for the sake of winning really going to accomplish anything but breach the closeness of our relationships? I would venture to say no. When Jesus was teaching his disciples in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, he said, you've heard it said To the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in in danger of the fire of hell. Mm. Stern words, stern warning from Jesus. Warring words are not the path that the Holy Spirit desires us to travel with our brethren. This is the worldly way of approaching things. You know, we see it on on the internet, the, the, the countless arguing and debating that's going on and anger. You see, as Christians, loving and kind hearted dialogue can go a long way to solving differences of opinion. There's going to be differences of opinion, and we've got to discuss them. But this can be done in control, in a loving dialogue that is, that is based out of, out of love for the other person. We can grow through the process of these respectful discussions. In this spirit, we are called to actively love our brothers and sisters, with the kind of love that's described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So when we have differences with our brothers or sisters, we need to keep this at the very focus point when we have our discussions with them. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-6 tells us, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not love, have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You see the emphasis on always? This is the love of God 
that God has shown us and has placed inside of us and that God desires to spill out into the lives of the others around us. This is a very practical love. It's not just a love of philosophy. It's not just a good thing to hear. It is a good thing for us to practice. You see, friends, it's, it's a fact that no child of God can be walking closely with their Lord and be fighting and quarreling with others in angry, pride-filled attitudes. It's not possible. And James seems to be bothered more by the selfish spirit and the bitterness of the quarrels than by the rights or wrongs of the various viewpoints themselves. When a person has actively given themselves over to a selfish spirit, he or she desires or covets to have his or her own way, but when things don't go their way, James says that they kill to try and get what they want. Well, they may not kill in the physical sense, but they murder their brother or sister in their heart, spilling that anger towards the opposing party's character, deepening the division and making it worse. So since these disputes are often consisting of harsh words, criticism, and slander behind the person's back, James no doubt refers back to what he talks about when he, when he explains the poison of the unbridled sinful tongue in, in, verses 12, in verse 12 of chapter 3. So what we've already gone through. It, it, it's clear that when we begin to dispute with others in this self-seeking manner, we're not going to get what we want in the end. Because God's not going to let us get what we want. They will not... We will not get what we want because we are approaching winning the dispute with the wrong motivation. In the second half of verse 2 and verse 3 of James chapter 4, James says this, You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And we've taken this verse out of context to mean a bunch of different things. But what this is talking about is conflict winning conflict and the pleasure of being on the top. When we have the wrong motives for proving a point to build up our own ego, we fail to consult God in the matter at hand. And even when we are praying to God, asking Him to help us to win our arguments over our brothers or sisters, God will refuse us to give us His heavenly wisdom in this case because we're approaching the matter strictly for the personal pleasure or satisfaction of appearing stronger or better than our opponents because we're right and they are wrong. The purpose of prayer, my friends, is to align our will with His will. It's not to persuade a reluctant God to do our bidding. The purpose of prayer is to align our will with His and in partnership with him to ask him to accomplish his will on this earth. And that's why it's so powerful in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, in addition, when we actually humble ourselves and open our spirits to hear the wisdom of the Holy Spirit through sincere prayer, we may actually find that the Holy Spirit changes our opinion on a matter and maybe it is me. It is us who need to adjust our thinking to align with the truth, not our brother or sister. See, when we bow our hearts, we bend our knees, we come to the Lord with humble attitudes, God's going to sift us. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, my Savior. We sing that song. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me, O oh Lord, if there is. You see, Sometimes we're so proud, we think that this only applies to somebody else, but guess what? We wrestle, and many of us stumble in many ways, and we need to pay attention here, because this is the human condition. If we're not walking closely with God, we will fall into this condition, guaranteed. Guaranteed. 
arguing points until tempers flare never does anyone any good. Even if we're proven right against our brother that in the disagreement, if we've won with an angry and argumentative attitude, we still lose, don't we? There's an American lecturer and philosopher named Dale Carnegie who's well known for his self-help guides. He's not a believing commentator, but he does have some very good points. And I'd like to read what he states because I've analyzed this and I thought, yeah, this, this is pretty close to the truth. Nine times out of ten, he says, an argument ends with each of the contestants firm, more firmly convinced than ever that he is absolutely right. You can't win an argument. You can't because if you lose it, you lose it. And if you win it, you win it. You lose it. Why? Well, suppose you triumph over the other man and shoot his argument full of holes and prove that he is non compus mentis. Then what? You will feel fine. But what about him? You've made him feel inferior. You've hurt his pride. He'll resent your triumph. And a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. See, this is the fleshly pattern. And when we yield to the way of the world and we go that path, there's no winner. And this can't have its place in the church. This is why James is so adamant about this subject. And I understand this is a difficult passage to preach because it's one of those passages where James is sort of laying a little bit of a boot down and saying, hey, we've got to smarten up. This is not something that's proper. See, the worldly mindset suggests that might makes right. Whether it's in the physical world by forcing one's way through fighting a war, and then you see the, the context of these fights and arguments with the militant flavor in the Greek um, whether that, that be in the physical world by forcing one's way through fighting a war or by intellectual jousting, beating our opponents by knocking them off their ide ideological horses. Right? So this can be in the physical, but it also can be verbally. However attractive debating is to prove our point in winning an argument, it's not God's way. And it's not fitting for a follower of Jesus Christ. Almost all who try to hotly battle it out with their brethren have the opinion that it is God who is prompting them and supporting them to do so. When in fact it is not God, it's not rooted in heavenly wisdom, as we've talked about the definition. It's rooted in worldly wisdom. It's rooted in human pride. To those of us, me included, who have yielded to a contentious and prideful spirit at times, James gives a robust rebuke in this passage. And I think we need to pay attention to his words. What does he say? He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So in context with what he's teaching in this chapter, when you read the passage that you read in the Bible, when, you, when you're reading something, you've got to take it in context. Far too often we pick a scripture here and we apply it over here without looking at the context of what it's talking about. You want to you wanna take a scripture and you want to read the passages above it and the patches, passages behind it because it's in context. See? In context with what he's teaching in this chapter, James goes on to paint the picture of God as a jealous lover of the souls of his saints. Why is he jealous? Because he loves us. We cannot be a man or woman of peace and love and service to God at the same time as being an angry man or woman with an edge, fighting and quarreling to get what we want 
for the sake of feeding our own ungodly human pride. James quotes in this passage a, a, a proverb of King Solomon that says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3.34 actually puts it this way. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. And the Apostle Peter also quotes this principle in 1 Peter chapter 5.5, 5, and in the same way, all you who are younger, submit to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. You see, there's a, an act of human will and participation with the will of the Holy Spirit. We must yield our will to Him and obey. And this obeying is actively clothing ourselves. When you clothe yourself in the morning and you get ready for your day, you actively put the clothes on. So all of you, he says, and Peter, clothe yourselves with humility towards each other. Now, the Greek word for the destructive human pride that James, re James refers to here is huperinophanos. And I, I don't know if I pronounced that exactly right, huperinophanos, which that literally means one who shows himself above other people. That's what this, this is talking about here, the destructive pride. And in consideration of this, God likens to displaying the worldly attitude of a proud, angry, fighting spirit towards others as being adulterous. In other words, we're taking God off the throne and we're worshiping self. This is spiritual adultery because I now become the one who calls the shots instead of leaving it to God. As believers, if we yield to this kind of sin, God's not going to let us get away with it. He will not let us get away with it because He loves us too much. In consideration of this, he, <laughs> because He loves us enough to correct us, when we do this kind of thing, we're going to come under painful discipline in various forms. God's blessings in various forms will be withdrawn in our lives because the Holy Spirit longs for us to walk in step with Him. His Spirit is jealous when we jump allegiances, embracing the patterns of this world rather than embracing the heavenly wisdom that He has given freely through His sacrifice and through His indwelling. God will resist us when we're proud, but he'll show favor to us when we humble ourselves before him. Why? Why endure needless hardships in a state of disobedience when we can be living in the peace and blessing of God? If we yield to the temptation to do the worldly thing, God's going to discipline us and it's going to hurt. Thankfully, when we let our pride get the best of us and we fail, God's grace is there. You see, God gives us enough grace to lead us toward repentance. We're then offered a direct path back to soundness of mind and closeness with Him. It's true, as stated in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it's true that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, when we allow the Lord's Word to penetrate our hearts, the Holy Spirit will illuminate our understanding to teach us Yes, and to rebuke us and correct us at times and train us in righteousness. I don't know about you, but I always like the teaching and the training part. <laughs> don't you? But in our humanity, we're not so keen to undergo the rebuking and the correcting part. But the good news is this, that God desires us to continue to grow in our faith and He loves us. 
He gives us grace to humble ourselves when we recognize our shortfallings. So James says it this way. He moves from this very stern rebuke into what we need to do about it. And this is what he says. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, God has not abandoned us to our own devices. If you're a child of God today, God loves you and He wants to refine you. And He wants to bring you to become more like Him. See, we don't have to be bound by our sinful nature. We're not slaves to it any longer. I've said this before. You are no longer a slave to sin. Yes, you have a choice whether you will or not, but you're no longer a slave bound to it because you have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. You are a child of God. And God says, submit to Him. There is a willful step that we need to take to submit to the Lord. We must make a willful decision to embrace the truth of His Word. We don't have to be bound by the enemy on a one-track, flesh-driven mind. When the devil or his demons yell into our ears to be proud and unyielding to the whisper of the Spirit of God, we can actually resist the temptation to listen to that enemy because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That is a beautiful promise that even though our enemy comes at us like a flood, God's power is greater The Word of God brings us to the truth of God. We're able to understand and discern the Word of God in its proper context when we're actively yielded to the Holy Spirit. When we come to Him and show that we're serious about pushing away from the the table of double-minded behavior and we willingly lay aside our pride, Then and only then will we find strength to be able to treat other people with the love that is in the definition of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when it comes to relationships in the church, having a loving demeanor towards others is not only a way to live, it is the most excellent way to live. And with this in mind, James reminds us again that the unbridled tongue damages relationships. If we are to refrain from fighting, quarreling, and divisiveness, we must yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and display the Holy Spirit's fruit in and through us, particularly in the area of self-control with this, with our tongues. Today, I don't, I don't know the story behind everyone's life here today. Everyone's got a unique journey. But I can tell you this, we're all alike in many ways. Because we all face the same kind of temptations. We all stumble in many ways, as we learned last week in James. But God gives us grace where we stumble. We don't have to say, stay in a place of, of, of negative consequence. Today, God's calling us to put the government of our lives on His shoulders and let Him become the Prince of Peace in us. The fruit of our lips needs a Holy Spirit-controlled temperament. And we have a choice this morning to yield or not to yield, to be driven by pride or to be motivated by His love through spiritual humility. James says it in this way in verse 11 of our text. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Man, when it comes to conflicts and differences of opinion, yielding to the Holy Spirit means that we're called to live according to the royal law 
of loving our neighbors as ourselves. See, love is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. To speak angrily against our, our brothers and sisters or to act as judge of their motives, it, it's wrong. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 13, 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Did you hear that? I'm going to read that again. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt. We owe a debt to one another. I owe a debt of love to you. You owe a debt of love to me. This is the, this is the Christ-like way. This is the way that Jesus lived and the way he taught. And whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. When, we asked, when, we, when asked by the Pharisees, which was the greatest of all the commands of God, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 to 40? He said this. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All, not just part, all the law and the prophets hang on these command, two commandments. All. You want to be pleasing to God? These are the two commandments that need to be at the center point of your life. Paul agrees with James and Jesus when he spoke to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 13, uh, 5, 13 to 18. He says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Remember context again? For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, that passage of Scripture has been taken and applied in a lot of ways. But if you look at it in context, this is talking about loving your neighbor as yourself and not gratifying the desires of the flesh to be right by biting and devouring each other with our, with our tongues. You see the big picture here? God wants us to be peacemakers. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers, not disturbers. Peacemakers. That's the way of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit here in Galatians is in line with the context of what Jesus tells us in Matthew, right? The, the most two, two most important commands. And it's in line with what James is, is telling us here in chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. Is my temperament and personality yielded to the Holy Spirit? Is my mind yielded to Him? How about my tongue? Do I need to repent and follow James' advice to submit to God and in all seriousness lay down my pride. If I come near to the Lord, He will come near to me. Our adversary, the devil, can't stand against a yielded saint. He can't. Because it's no longer that I that liveth, but Jesus Christ, by the power of His Spirit that liveth in me and in you when you're His child. You are not your own. You are purchased with a price, with the precious blood of the Lamb, and you are given the Spirit as a down payment guaranteeing what is to come in the future. And what is to come in the future, friends? No, even this, wor this world is going to fall apart. Everything is going to blow up. What comes in the future is eternal life in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords for those that love Him. <sighs> what a beautiful promise. So here and now, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. We need to crucify 
the desires of the sinful nature, and we can't do that alone, can we? You ever try to do what you think you should do in your own strength? You fall flat on your face pretty fast. This calls for humility before God, bowing the knee of our hearts before God, saying, Lord, if, if I've got an idol, if that idol is me or something else, I just need to lay it down. And I'm just going to end with reading this scripture this morning. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says it, wraps it right up. He says this, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Get this. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Call the music team up, and let's bow our hearts before the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you today understanding, Lord, that we can't make this journey on our own strength, God. We, we can't live in a way that pleases you on our own. We need you, we need you Lord, to, to strengthen us, to give us your power to, to live in a way that is pleasing to you. Our flesh is so so loud, God, it always wants to elevate itself. Would you forgive us, Lord, for the times where we get it wrong? Father, where we allow our hearts and our tongues to depart heavenly wisdom and embrace earthly wisdom and unspiritual wisdom, that really is not wisdom at all. God, heal us inside. Forgive us, Lord, where we need to be forgiven. If there's any attitudes in our hearts, Lord, that need to be flushed away, please do it. Help our hearts to be soft and tender to you. We thank you, God, for your grace that you've given to us, that we can come to your throne of grace and we can receive forgiveness and restoration into a close relationship with you. You are our Father and your arms are open wide. God, I pray that people that have been hurt over the years by the different things that have happened, God, that you'd bring healing. You'd restore your body, God, that we would be a reflection of you and that, God, we would remain on point with our mission, that it, this wouldn't just be about a social club for us, but would be a point of mission that the world out there would see the love that we have one for one another and for you. And they would know that we are your disciples. And that that light would draw people to repentance and to coming into full relationship with you. Go with us now, Lord, as we, we go into the rest of our day and our week and guide us, Lord, and strengthen us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, would you?